I, I mean, Ben, I, 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 it's who I am, right? I, I mean, and I spent long enough kind of not saying anything that it, I, I don't know. I, I mean, why not? Season two, episode 13. Hey, everybody, it's Ben. I've been so excited about this episode for, for a while now. Even before we recorded this conversation, it's just, this episode feels like the culmination of a lot for me on this podcast. Just a lot of great things coming together in our conversation with our guest today, Reggie, who I've wanted to talk to for a long time. There's some backstory to it, and I'll get to that. First, I want to give a huge shout out to Bandrew Scott. He's the host of the Bandrew Says podcast and the guy behind Podcastage which is just this, this amazing resource for anybody who wants to get into podcasting uh, in terms of making podcasts. If that idea has been in your mind and you have questions about, you know, like what gear do I buy? You know, is this microphone any good? Bandrew is your guy on YouTube. Amazing resource at Podcastage. I mean, it's kind of like an encyclopedia of what you need to, to start a podcast. On a recent episode of Bandrew Says, again, that's his podcast, he gave some seriously kind words to the Tourette's podcast, which just made my day that he shared it with his audience. It, it wasn't entirely a random thing. Uh, I had actually written into his show with a computer-related question, and in the course of answering it on his show, he gave some really, really kind words to the Tourette's podcast. So, Bandrew, thank you, and I will always refer budding podcasters and technology junkies your way. And for people interested, I'll uh, include links to those resources to podcast again to the Bandry Says podcast in the show notes with this episode at tretspodcast.libson.com. Now, something from the listener mailbag here, and I guess it's kind of a philosophical question about Tourette syndrome, and it comes from somebody named Justin. Uh, he actually has three questions. One's kind of heavy and frankly kind of challenging, and the other two are, are more fun. Be thinking of how you would answer this first question as I read it. So here's his email. Justin says, Hey Ben, thank you for the podcast. I find it enlightening to hear from people who live with TS the way that I do. I started listening this season and have gone back and listened to most of the episodes and find it interesting how different people cope with their Tourette's. But it also leads me to some questions. Some of your guests have said that their parents didn't want them to get diagnosed because they were worried it would create a label for them that would make their lives difficult. The point seemed to be that maybe they could overcome their challenges and live with less stress if they didn't have difficult labels like Tourette's. You said yourself that you hid your diagnosis from the public for most of your life because you were worried what people think or how they would treat you. Here are my questions. Could it be that hiding your diagnosis helped you? Do you think there's something to the idea that avoiding labels could help us overcome our problems? I'm not saying it's right to ignore Tourette syndrome, and maybe I'm playing devil's advocate, but I think it's interesting to think about. I have two more questions. Does coffee make your tics worse? Do you drink coffee? I love it, but have had to stop because it sets off my tics and makes me anxious. It wasn't always that way, but for some reason my tics got to be horrible when I drunk coffee. That was a couple years ago, and things have calmed down since I stopped. I'd love to bring coffee back, though. My last question. As I said, I listen to your podcast because it's enlightening. Enlightenment is something I look for in all the podcasts I listen to. Do you have any recommendations for other enlightening podcasts? All right, and that's an email from Justin. So, well, first of all, Justin, thank you for your questions. And I do invite challenging questions like the first one we just heard here. And it's possible that you, the listener, are already darting to answer it. And before I get started on my thoughts, which I will keep brief in the interest of time here... You can weigh in and respond to Justin's question by emailing me at Tourette'sPodcast at gmail.com. And I'll read your response on the show. You can also send me a voice memo, you know, just speak it into your phone and email that to me at Tourette'sPodcast at gmail.com and I'll just drop it into the episode. Or you can type it, whatever you prefer. Or you can go to the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook, which hasn't been around all that long and has already hit the 100 member mark. We're actually now beyond 100 members. All very active. Thanks to Sophia, the admin, for helping us reach that milestone. Okay, so that first question, is there merit to avoiding the TS label? And if I can rephrase or if I'm interpreting the question the right way, I, I guess I, I get the concept 
you know, that you can free yourself by avoiding labels and definitions that may in some cases play, place these artificial limitations or perceptions of limitation on yourself, and that you can, you can do more if you're not distracted by or burdened by a label and you can live your life on your own terms and make your decisions and carve out your impact on the world and yourself by doing what's best for your specific case in your life. So that's kind of my interpretation of the point of the question. And so I guess that's to say that the answer to that question, to Justin's question, will have to vary by person. And I'm saying that with the utmost hesitancy, and I'm going to pivot to something else in a second, but let me just say for the sake of argument that, you know, some people might be able to get away with that, with saying, you know, I've got these tics and comorbidities, but who cares what you call them? Who cares what they are? I'm going to live my life and overcome challenges, whatever they are, so I don't need to be assigned a label. I mean, that's, you know, that's one way of looking at it. And that's certainly not for everybody, but if you do, you do. And whether that's good or bad just kind of depends on how it all plays out. But for me, and Justin's right, I did choose to hide my TS deep into my adult life. And he's right that I was worried about the social and professional ramifications of people knowing that I had TS and then, you know, totally misunderstanding me or treating me differently or, I mean, he's right about that. And that gave me a lot of, you know, fear and just kind of killed my confidence. But in my case, what set me free and really alleviated all, you know, all sorts of pressure and anxiety was the moment that I decided to start talking openly and dissolving all my shame and and doing this podcast and talking to so many people who've helped me to understand myself. And so embracing this label has created for me this, this huge sense of community and commonality that I, I mean, I, I guess just makes me feel better about everything. And that's not a Pollyanna way of looking at it, I don't think. I was just, I was sick of myself for my long-standing policy of being in the Tourette closet. And I hated masking my tics and playing things off, you know, like I was normal. I say that in quotes, but, you know, playing things off in order to gain some illusion of acceptance. You know, when I was not the problem. And so I moved from what you could call apologizing for TS or or disassociating from it to becoming somebody who firmly thinks there's nothing anyone needs to apologize for when they truly can't control it. And I think claiming Tourette syndrome as a point of pride kind of helps you get past that or helped me. And so I'm, I'm not doing this podcast here to serve as, you know, inspiration for people who don't have TS. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm not really even doing it for the inspiration of people who do have TS either, at least not directly or not necessarily, anyway. I think this has everything to do with just letting loose and learning about ourselves and doing what we want with that information, having the chance to talk about ourselves. And ideally, the effect is that, you know, we collectively feel less isolated and we get, we, we feel a lot better about everything if that applies. Or at least we get a better sense of direction and a more reliable compass. Hopefully that makes you feel good or more educated or resourceful or part of the community. I don't know. And for non-Tourette people listening, I hope they get to learn about Tourette syndrome in a way that they typically don't. And I'll say I myself do learn from this. I mean, just doing this podcast broadens my sense of inclusion and how I judge things around me and and people around me too. And, and what I think they need and what I think their lives are like and what they want. Or, you know, it's just helped me check my assumptions about a number of things. Whatever it is, whatever you call it, I'm just glad we all get to talk openly about what a lot of people don't understand and and tell stories that people just don't get to hear, even within the TS community. So I I don't know. I hope all that came out the right way. Uh, A short answer to that question of, you know, is there merit to eschewing the label? Uh, Well, not for me. So I I do want to know what you guys think. It's a good conversation. It could spark arguments, but... We're all individuals, TS or not, we're all individuals. I just know that I, as an individual, benefit enormously from you individuals, just from having the chance to talk with you. So I hope all that came out the right way. Um, Okay, so the coffee question. I drink so much coffee in my daily life that it's just part of the noise floor for me. It's baseline, it's it's what I do, it's never not happening. So I, I would need to take a break from coffee to really know if it's affecting my tics. And I don't yet have the will to do that. So I I will say a number of years ago, I did take a year long break from coffee. Altogether, I stopped for a full year, but I don't recall feeling much different in terms of tics. What did feel different was my wallet. 
If you figure three trips every day to the coffee shop, plus a tip for the barista each time, I mean, that's a lot of money I saved, just as an aside. Okay, so Justin's third question, enlightening podcasts. Um, my longest running favorite podcast is called Skeptoid. Skeptoid is a, is a critical thinking podcast that takes on uh, pop culture topics or urban myths or conspiracy theories, food fads, things like that. Just, just things that go around that people say all the time and we just kind of accept them as fact because of popular belief. And so Skeptoid incorporates research and critical thinking exercises to determine whether this thing that people say is actually true. So I, I find that enlightening and challenging and it's just a good exercise, this critical thinking exercise. I'll also recommend a podcast called 99% Invisible, which you might very well know about already. It's pretty popular. It's about things that just kind of hide in plain sight. And then Hidden Brain, which again is very popular. You've probably heard of it. And then I listen to these frightening, eye-opening podcasts about internet security issues that uh, basically just scare me into buying pricey antivirus software. One of the podcasts is called Hackable, um, which is pretty good. And then there's another one called Cyber that actually just came out recently. And again, it's about cybersecurity issues. And, and I think that's everything that fits under the enlightening category. Uh, everything else I listen to is super niche focused and not really enlightening per se, but you know, entertaining and educational for sure. And boy, okay, so I just talked a lot. And well, Justin, thank you so much for your email and for your questions. Can't wait to hear what other people say. And uh, we got to get to this week's conversation, which is such a good one. Again, Reggie is our guest. And so you know how I always say that I never got to speak with anybody in my adult life with TS until this podcast. Well, he would be the one exception, a limited exception. I've never met him in real life or anything, but I did find him on Twitter. I noticed that he lived in North Carolina, as I do, and I sent him a message. And um, this is a couple of years ago. So what I'm saying right now actually answers part of the conversation ahead. We were trying to remember how we became aware of each other or how I became aware of him in the first place. And I went back uh, through my Twitter messages. It turns out that he had tweeted something um, about a, a different subject entirely, but it was something I was familiar with. And he ended up in my Twitter feed. I noticed that he had TS in his Twitter bio or Tourette syndrome. And I, I reached out and said, you know, hey, I never do this, but I have TS. And that was a, a, a bit before this podcast started. And we talked and, you know, not every day or anything like that, but I knew that I wanted to get him in on this podcast. And it's definitely worth noting that in addition to having Tourette syndrome himself, his son does too. And after way too much time had passed, we finally got to record one here and it went really, really well. We just start rolling right out of the gate. And uh, I think there's a lot here. I'll leave you with it. This is me and Reggie. Hey, I'm, I'm ready whenever you are. Okay, cool, cool. So uh, <laughs> state your name and just kind of the, the, the part of the world you live in and how you would describe yourself to, to listeners. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Reggie Whitley, I am 42 years old. I live just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I have two kids, 15-year-old and 11-year-old. Um, I have worked in corporate world since I was about 19 years old and I have been aware of my Tourette's at least from a medical standpoint since I was 19. Okay. Okay. And I got to say real quick too, I mean, this has been a, a pretty long time coming and uh, you know, I, I've said on the podcast a million times that before the podcast started, I hadn't really interacted or talked to anybody, um, in my adult life who has Tourette syndrome. and I guess you would be the exception, and I forget exactly how, I, I know it was by way of Twitter, but I can't remember how I got connected to you, if it was just through the algorithms or, or what, but I'm, I'm glad it did. I, I remember I was standing in a coffee shop, and I either tweeted at you or sent you a message, or you sent me one or something like that, but T Tourette syndrome was the common denominator, and uh, that was really the first time in my adult life that I had had really any interaction with someone who was very, uh, you know, similar to me, I guess, I guess, just in terms of what we go through, you know, we have some different life experiences. I don't have any kids or anything like that, but I mean, we're both in North Carolina. I haven't met you in person. I hope to change that, uh, one day soon, but I, you said you were medically aware of it around age 19. When did, uh, 
uh, maybe from a, a sub medical level. Wh- when did Tick start to to present with you? What's your background? Yeah, you know, I, I remember, uh, and I, as we were getting ready for this, uh, I, I remember um, first noticing them around nine to eleven years old. I, I'm I'm pretty sure there were things before them, but. Um, you know, when, when I, I hit middle school, that's kind of when I started noticing there was, there was a thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would notice, you know, little ticks. A lot of them were, um, the ones that people would point out to me is I blinked a lot and I would blink really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I, I, my first real kick where it was a, Hey, something's different and I can't stop this is I, my hair had grown a little long, um, uh, when I was 12 and I started a head shake mm-hmm. and that stuck for about two months. And it was, I mean, that's the one that, you know, it, it and I'm sure most folks with Tourette's that, you know, can point this out. That was kind of a traumatic one mm-hmm. and that it was so obvious yeah. and I was in middle school and kids, uh, kids, uh, can, can be rough. So that's the one where really it was like, all right, this is, you know, this is not, this is not usual. And I, I don't know why I can't stop that. Uh, so what, one of your, your kids has Tourette's, what, was there anybody before you, uh, parents, uncles, anything like that, who, who seemed to have any ticks? Yeah, I, I have a, I have a half brother who's older and he had, um, he had a lot of different issues, but he had, he had ticks as well. Um, and he's actually how I realized that and, and took any steps to medically, uh, determine that I had Tourette's. He, he had some legal issues and was, I don't really remember exactly what it was, but he was in a position that a, uh, psychiatrist took a look at him and said, Hey, listen, I think you have Tourette's syndrome. And when that was mentioned to me, um, I engaged a neurologist and went through the testing and, and that's where, that's where I found out that, Hey, yeah, this, this weird thing that you have is Tourette's. So b- back when you were a kid, uh, how did you, how did you navigate that with, I mean, you know, kids can be rough. I mean, it, I, I remember with, with my head shake ticks and, and I had this thing where I would, I would move my neck a certain way to where, and what I was trying to accomplish, I guess, was the hair at the back of my head was, was touching the sort of top of my spine, if that makes sense. And th- that's yeah. one that, that kids around me, they would just mimic or imitate every single time I I did it, or even if I wasn't doing it, even if I had moved on from that tick and I had something else going on, they would still, that was sort of my trademark, I guess. And they, they would, they would do that around me just to kind of like watch me, watch them do it. And that they had right. picked up on, you know, what was unusual about me. And that was just, that, that, that was sort of their, their weird way of picking on me. But h- how did, how did you handle that? Or what did you do about it? <laughs> I, so I was a really socially awkward kid when I was, when yeah. I was younger. Uh, and I, I didn't handle it well. I, I mean, it, it was one of those things I really internalized. Um, and I was really hard on myself about it. I was able to stop the head check it, it, uh, over Christmas break. And I was really, really intent. And I just, I, I would count off seconds and minutes that I would go without yeah. doing it. And I am lucky that I, I can actually do that. I know some folks don't reach that, you know, never reach that point. If I can hold and really focus, sometimes I can break them. And luckily I broke that one. It took about, it, it took about two and a half weeks the, the whole time Christmas was out and then it, it was finally gone. But, um, you know, that, that was one that, you know, if I'm being honest, it was just because kids are brutal mm-hmm. and I was ready to yeah. be done with that. So, um, it, it, it was, it was, it was rough, but once it was gone, you know, life, life kind of eased up mm-hmm. a little bit, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, between that period, uh, you know, middle school and, and, and 19, I mean, you've, you've got a handful of years that you have to, that you have to get through. Uh, d- did your, did your ticks kind of fluctuate over time? I mean, I'm sure they, they fluctuated in how they presented, but, uh, in terms of intensity and so on, uh, did you get a break at any point or did you get the feeling that, Oh, this might go away or was there anything like that? Yeah. Well, I had a ridiculous growth spurt between 14 and 15 hmm. and it, they eased up after that. And, and when I say eased up, I mean, I, I didn't have the obvious, you know, um, something you can't kind of play off or, or that kind yeah. of thing. So after I had a growth spurt, it, it eased up some, 
I got a little more comfortable with myself. Like, I guess like a lot of kids do, you know, when you kind of settle into your body and, um, it just, it didn't bother me as much. I mean, I, I still remember ticks. I still remember things that I had. Um, but it, it, they eased up on me a little bit when yeah. I was in high school. Okay. Okay. So uh, at that point, uh, and we hear it a lot that, you know, it, that Tourette's or ticks may kind of ease up as we get older. Uh, did you kind of think that you were kind of getting out of the out of the woods, so to speak, or did, did that help help with confidence and uh, social interaction, it, things like that? It, it did, but you know, it, it's one of those things that as I got a little older and got a little more self aware, and you, I, I guess when you get out of the me 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 kind of world you are when you're a teenager, I, I noticed things are yeah. Things were different, right? I, I was a, I was different than, than other people. Not just in I mean, not just in physical ticks, but I, I knew I, I was more obsessive than than other folks. Um, mm-hmm. I, I didn't always process things the same way. Yeah. Um, I started figuring out that hey, you know, I, there are ways that I'm not learning the same as other folks. So that kind of prompted me to still pursue the Tourette's thing. So even though it eased up on the tick side, uh, the physical tick side. All the other stuff, uh, you know, it pushed me to, to to still check it out. So even though the tick, the physical tick part had eased up, um, still recognize all the other all the other stuff that was with it that that um, was presenting. So. Yeah, I mean that that's such a good point. And even though we, you know, we, we've said on the podcast before, but it it's still important to repeat that that ticks. I mean that that's the sort of surface level stuff that people associate with Tourette syndrome. Um, you know, often erroneously in a lot of respects, but but that's still you know that's what Tourette syndrome is as far as like the walking knowledge, the pedestrian knowledge of what it is, and it's not always seen. I mean, the way you described it, you basically described me too. It just the really weird social awkwardness, um, the confidence issues, me just knowing that I'm not learning the way these other kids are learning. Why am I behind on this? And why am I ahead on this other thing? And you know, what, what, ex- what, ex- what explains this? And, and, and what do I do about it too? Am I just going to be an underachiever in math my whole life? Or is there a different way for me to, to kind of engage this? Or, I mean, it, it it's, it's a really rattling thing to try to to wrap your head around and, and see what the way out is. And it, it's also too, you know, when I was younger, um, I think intelligence was just intelligence and, you know, your IQ was just how, how smart you were or, or yeah. otherwise. And w- without really recognizing that there are different kinds of intelligences that, you know, I, I think that thought might've helped me in terms of confidence and, you know, the, the, the hiding that I would go into, especially in social situations where I'm like, God, it's just, I hope they don't make eye contact with me or I hope <laughs> nobody right. asks me a question, that that kind of thing. Cause it's, I, I would just rather not engage because I didn't have that sense of command that I, I feel like I should have had, but getting out of high school and uh, I mean, c- could you talk about the, the sort of decision that sent you to the neurologist and, and w- what you did with that information once, once you got a diagnosis? Yeah, you know, it, it's it, it was one of those things where when I, the first thing I ever remember about Tourette syndrome was an episode of 2020, which that's for anybody who's younger, like a news show that was came on mm-hmm. Friday nights on ABC. Uh, they did uh, they did kind of the, the the first thing I'd ever seen about Tourette syndrome, and it was a very newscast kind of thing where you have somebody who does punching and they curse and things like that. So mm-hmm. when I'm thinking about Tourette syndrome, that, that wasn't me. Right. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I didn't have, I didn't have that, but when my, when I found out my, my brother had been diagnosed, I, I was like, well, it, it, that's gotta be something. Right. So, um, I, I went to a neurologist and, you know, even, even the neurologist was, I got this with me and I got this with, with my son in that, well, yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. So yeah, you have Tourette's, but you know, okay. But Mm -hmm. to me, knowing was a big deal. I mean, that's, you know, you you suddenly have a, you suddenly have a thing that, that, that starts making sense of, uh, of years of issues you've had. And, and, uh, you know, so seeking that out and, and, and just kind of finding out, yeah, this, this is, this is what this is helped a lot, even though, yeah, there, there's not a lot you can do and there's not a lot of treatment that you can have, but, you know, just kind of having a, having a name to it made a difference. D- did you try certain kinds of therapies or medications or anything? 
Um, as I got older, I started taking a medication for obsessiveness because I, I, I get very easily stuck on ideas or things that would bother me. As mm-hmm. I've gotten older, I, I mean, if I, if I miss my medication, I, I can get very close to being like a hand washer. Uh, I get very obsessed about how mm-hmm. my hands feel. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, I, I mean, it's not, I haven't taken anything to, to help with ticks, but for obsessiveness, I did. Gotcha. I mean, so what, what did, uh, did, did you kind of have personal ways of managing ticks or, or, or were, were your ticks at the point where you, where, where you felt like you did have to manage or, or, or hide or mask or, uh, you know, w- when it came to kind of being in the world with Tourette syndrome, did you let it do its own thing or, or, or did you have other ways of engaging? I have always, um, and I don't know how, I don't remember how I got, you know, kind of to this point. I've been very honest with folks. Like I, the only time I really need to stop a tick is if it's causing pain. I've had them in my shoulder before or in my knee and they've caused pain. But honestly, I'm really open with, with what I have. And yeah. so if somebody's seeing me tick, Hey, you know, this is what it is. If you have questions, I've even gotten to the point, I've even gotten to the point I fly a good bit for work. I'll tell the person in the middle seat, Hey, I'm not, I'm not trying to bump you on purpose. I have threats. <laughs> and okay. you know, so, so if it happens, that that's what's going on. But for me, that, you know, getting comfortable with that, I have not gotten negative reactions from folks. I mean, you get the joke always, are you going to start cursing or, or whatever, which, sure. uh, yeah. you know, you try to educate folks on that, but um, it, it, it's, um, it, 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 I, I try to be as honest as I can. And I've, I've had a very positive, um, positive response from that. That's amazing. I mean, so, and it, you might have to reiterate, but, uh, but, but kind of getting to that point of, cause I mean, it, again, with me, I mean, it wasn't until like a year ago that, that really kind of, it was after we talked actually the, the first time on Twitter, I, I was still very, very much closeted about the whole thing. And it, wow. it just sort yeah. of took me you know, getting, getting sick of myself, um, and being like, like, dude, what are you doing? Just, just, just try being yourself. You're almost 40. Try being yourself at this point in your life. And, and, and I haven't had any negative reactions when it comes to, and and again, uh, I haven't really broken it cold to any strangers to where I, I could really experience, uh, what kind of reaction they would give me. But, you know, when I told coworkers or friends, you know, a lot of them are like, Oh, had no idea. Or it's, you know, Oh, that that's really cool. And they have a couple, you know, actually, you know, uh, uh genuinely curious questions about it. That gives me the chance to talk about it more, which I love. But th- do you remember the point when you felt comfortable enough to just kind of say it? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it was, um, when I started, dating more in college. And, uh, you know, I, I realized, I realized that my facial tics were taken as reaction. Yeah. I didn't know they were doing it. And, you know, I, I realized that, Hey, listen, I, I have to say something about this because I don't want, uh, I, I don't want somebody I'm out on a date with thinking that I'm reacting to something she's saying, right. Yeah, and, or, yeah. or that it's something negative. So, I, you know, I, I kind of got in the habit of them, but even before then, I I, I don't really know the point, but it, it's just, I, I guess, you know, you kind of have that first experience of, hey, this is what it is, and it's not that negative, and I, I just, I got a little more comfortable with it, so, um, you know, and, and I'll ask people sometimes, I'm like, I, I hope you don't think this is oversharing, but I would like to kind of make you aware. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and I got a job with working with uh, a bank when I was when I was 19, not long after I was diagnosed. Yeah. And I was just really honest. And, and hey, listen, guys, this is this is why I'm moving like this. And th- this is what this is this is what happened. And it wasn't you know it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't something that really. It was a phone job, so it wasn't something that for me was causing some noticeable thing. But I, yeah. you know, I. I I brought it up and the response was always, okay, well, you know, that, that's okay. And, uh, it was, like I said, it was positive. So. Yeah. It, it's kind of like, I don't know th- this, this analogy has not lived inside my head for, uh, any more than 20 seconds. So it, it may not match up the right way, but it's almost, I, I think to me, 
with my circumstances. It's almost like being afraid of heights and then, you know, making the decision to do a bungee jump or something and you, you, you survive it and you're fine and you're good. And it's almost exhilarating that you're like, okay, you know, I, I, I can do this or riding a roller coaster or whatever it is. I mean, it's just, for me, it's that initial fear of reaction that, uh, or, or misunderstanding, or I'm going to write myself off if I say anything further about this, uh, or if, you know, the, the stranger on the bus and they get up and they take another seat after they learn that I'm, you know, or I have issues, quote unquote. And, but getting to the point, especially at work, I mean, it's been really, really nice to be able to sit in my cubicle and my boss sits right behind me and uh and tick freely and it's no big deal and nobody says anything because they get it now whereas uh had i not said anything they would be wondering you know like what's what's my issue like what's you know is there a a a substance issue or is there something more we need to know about before we you know recommend him for a promotion i mean i'm I'm just sort of like making up some hypotheticals here but but it, it is that fear that just of of what if in a negative sense that keeps me or, or keeps a lot of people from from discussing their threats further but so uh d- do you, you you mentioned that being a phone job earlier what, do, do you have an office environment that you're in uh I, I work from home but i do uh roughly once a month go into the office and, and one of the one of the i i, I i'm in a position now where I deal with clients more like where we're actually selling things to clients. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went through a phase where one of my ticks unusually stopped me from talking and I would get stuck and I could not say a word. Me too. Um, Man, and it, yeah. yeah. It, it, and it would, co- it would come out of the blue. And so I was on the phone, getting on the phone with the client and it was not mm-hmm. one that we could get off of. It was a, you know, we were close to kind of getting to a deal. So it wasn't something I wanted to, I wanted to cancel. So I I was like, you know what, I'm going to try this. And I told him, I was like, guys, I I have Tourette's syndrome for whatever reason. One of my ticks right now is I get stuck and I can't talk. If that happens, please don't assume anything about the, you know, anything about the phone call or anything about me, it'll come back and I'll come back. Their reaction was so positive and supporting. Hmm. It was amazing. So I, I don't have a problem with clients or anything. I, I mean, particularly if it's in person, I'm like, guys, listen, I have threats. I might move around. You know, I, I was like, I, I'm probably not going to say anything out of turn, but I'm just letting you know. And, you know, people are, people are fine. I, you know, I'll get, yeah. I'll get questions and that kind of thing, but it's, you know, that, that first experience with, with, with those folks, when I had to share that, it was so positive. I, you know, I, I don't have a problem if I'm if I'm having a day where I've got more ticks and, and it, it's interacting with with a client. I'll tell them, and and it, it's I've never had a negative response from that. God, that's amazing. I mean, that's that's yeah. really really important to hear. I mean, just the I mean, th- th- there are a million dynamics that affect people's lives, and you know, the the result could be different depending on who you are and who you're around and all that. Yeah. But just just that story is, uh, yeah, I, I, I love hearing that. I mean, d- d- are there work factors that influence your tics, uh, stress or anything like that? Or Yeah. If I'm, if I'm stressed out or, um, or I'm, uh, uh, under a deadline, um, my, my, my tics will pick up. Um, if, if I, I go through phases where I can get, um, distracted or even I have a social aspect to it where sometimes I don't read cues. Right. And I have been very clear with, with folks who I report to, I'm like, if I'm not giving you something that you're expecting, I need you to tell me that Uh, don't assume that I'm just being kind of off to the side. You're not, Mm -hmm. you know, that I've kind of blown you off. Um, I need you, I need you to let me know. And I've had positive response from that too. And I've had folks tell me, Hey, you know, Reggie, listen, um, I need you to get this to me and such and such. And, and, and that's been fine. So, uh, yeah, I, I'll go through stages where it, it's worse sometimes than, than others. And, and, it, you know, it's funny, the getting stuck and not being able to talk mm-hmm. <laughs> was getting very specific to client calls. Hmm. And so, yeah. so, I mean, cause you know, you're under, you're under stress. And so it, it's, but once I started talking about that kind of eased up some, uh, not always, but uh, you know, when, when the stress of that went away and it's not a thing where you're like, Oh my gosh, what's going to happen if this happens? Um, that got a little mm. easier. So, 
Yeah, it's it's funny because I, I had the exact same tick of of just stopping. I, I would stop talking and hold my breath and just not do anything and basically just uh, almost like a state of paralysis for whatever, five, six, seven seconds. It, it, enough time right. for it to be kind of weird for the other person who's expecting right. me to say something in the moment because they think I'm just thinking something grave about what they just said or, or it, it, it's... <laughs> right. It can it can be really strange, but but I never ever took the step of telling them or explaining to them what it would be. And there have definitely been times, you know, back when I was a news reporter, where I would be on the phone with a source, and I would just stop talking, and they could hear. I mean, you could tell the line didn't go dead. I was just just not saying anything. And what I was hoping was that um, they would assume that I was just writing something down, you sure. know, just taking a minute to write something down, you know, based on what they said. But inevitably, it was always like, "Hello, like, you still there, like, Ben?" You know, and and but I, I never. It was just that fear of mine. I, I just, I just never went for it to tell them, like, "Okay, here's what that was." If in case that happens again, I, I, I mean, Ben, I, 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 this, it's who I am, right? I, I mean, and I spent long enough, kind of not saying anything. That it, I, I don't know. I, I mean. Why not? If I was, I don't know, if I was diabetic and, and having to do an insulin shot or if I was in a wheelchair and something like that, I mean, you know, those are obvious things. And, and mm-hmm. this is, this is similar. I, I mean, you know, if you, if you have questions, ask away, but this is kind of what's going on. And, uh, you know, it, it's after a few positive reactions, you know, it, it it got easier. And now, Hey, if somebody has a problem with it, I, I can't imagine what it would be. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. like, it, it's okay. You're, you're bothered by it. I, I, Hey, you know, this is, this is kind of, this is kind of what it is. So. Yeah. Well, have you had situations where it, it just, just didn't take with the person you were talking to, or you had some negative judgments or, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, but it, it it's, it's situations you would, you would kind of expect. There's always sure. those folks who feel like, they have a fix for you, uh, yeah. some diet related, something that you could eat that would fix mm-hmm. it. Or, yeah. you know, I heard such and such something in the water causes these problems or an older <laughs> person that doesn't necessarily believe it's a real thing. Yeah. And, you know, with, with that, I have, I mean, that's one thing that kind of gets to me if I get that. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, Hey, listen, you know, if, if this were another situation, and again, I go back to, someone that was in a wheelchair, would you tell them that there was something they could eat to make them walk again? Well, probably right. not. Right. right. I, I mean, it's, it, and I keep going back to that because someone in a wheelchair, it's obvious, right? It's a very obvious thing that this person has a situation where they can't walk. Well, you're not going to sit there and tell this person that what is going on with them doesn't exist. It's just right. going to do that. So yeah. um, if I have negative things like that, and I try to take a breath. Um, I try to educate him as best I can. And I, I have had to end some conversations with, Hey, okay. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. I'm sorry. You don't believe it, but you know, I've had so many positive responses. I'm okay with that conversation. And it, there's so few, then there's so few I've had with that, that, um, I, you know, I, I don't worry if they come up and if they do, I know I'm right and they're wrong. And, and yeah. I, I don't mean to make it sound that simple, but you know, Hey, I'm sorry you don't believe it. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So. It, it's yeah, it, it's a really good point, and and, and also I, I like the way you're saying it too, because sometimes when somebody does learn, uh, it, whether it's they know as a matter of fact what you're going through, uh, but by label I mean, or if they assume that you have something that you need help with, and the assumption is that you need help, it's almost it, people have recommended things to me that oh you should try this or you should you know I had a friend who a friend of a friend who had Tourette syndrome and they did this one thing and their tics went away or, and that's usually, you know, extremely illegitimate. Um, but it, it also assumes that, that y- you're on board with being quote unquote fixed. And I, I, I don't care what I have. I mean, I, I, just like you said earlier, I mean, it's, it's a part of me and I can explain it. And if they, if they understand it, then there's no issues at all. Um, the, the, the difference would be, I understand if somebody wants to, you know, alleviate their tics because they have pain or if it really, really is a barrier. And I have to be careful, um, about how I say that, but I, I think the, the ultimate point that I'm trying to make is that, that with a lot of people, I mean, you can create understanding and get past so many of these issues just by, by getting away from any sort of a uncertainty, but also 
diffusing the the sort of negative association someone might have with not being yeah. of perfect health. And, and again, I'm putting that in quotes. It's just uh, th- things can be a lot easier with people just kind of talking about it and accepting it and not viewing it as something that needs to be fixed or resolved for the person who's going through it. Yeah, right. I, I, it's I, I'm wired differently than you, as I would be yeah. talking to someone. I'm wired differently than you. This is not something that, you know, I, I don't have, and, you know, excuse the, the comparison, I don't have cancer. Like, I, I'm not, I can't get treatment and try to get cancer to go away. I'm mm-hmm. wired differently than you are. Right. And that's more than just me ticking. And it's more than just, you know, me not being able to necessarily pay attention. The way I'm wired is different. That's who I am. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it, and I've gotten comfortable with that. And th- I think that's kind of been one of the main one of the main things, right, that, that I know that's true, and I'm not worried that somebody else doesn't believe that. It irritates me. Don't get me wrong. I get irritated when someone doesn't understand that, but mm-hmm. I'm comfortable that, you know, I, I mean, hey, this is who I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, I, I occasionally get emails from uh, from parents or from from people who've been diagnosed who are who are trying to communicate that, especially within their family. Sometimes there is denial uh, because they understand Tourette syndrome sort of for the the stereotype of it. And they think it's something that's just going to wreck their lives. And, uh, you know, we, we, we should, but let's, let's avoid the label. So we don't have to, uh, you know, let, let's view it as something we can overcome versus something we need to accept. And uh, which can be really, really problematic. Um, and, trying to get people inside your family to accept you for yourself. And as somebody who can live with Tourette syndrome, if you're, if people inside your family don't accept that, that can be really painful, which I think makes, uh, if I may, makes your son, I think, in a very fortunate position to have you as a father because, A, you've adopted a really, really, really Tourette positive attitude and you can help him out with anything he needs help with in that regard. I mean, could, could you, did, did you, knowing that it, it there's a, a, genetic angle on Tourette syndrome, had it already crossed your mind that, uh, that you might have offspring who has Tourette syndrome? Yeah. My, when it was one of the things that came up when, when my wife was pregnant, we were going to some of the first, um, visits to the doctor and they were asking, you know, your genetic, uh, issues that you might have and things like that. And that kind of, that came up. Um, my, my son, when he was born and I want to, I want to make sure to frame some of what came before with, with what he's saying to, uh, with, with, um, stuff about him too. So, uh, sure. because there, there's a big, there's a big part of that that has helped it make sense for me that, um, that I hope some of this conversation is going to, going to help. So, um, mm-hmm. when, when he, when he was young, he was really, really smart. And I know that common for kids with Tourette's that they're usually a little more accelerated in some cases than, than other kids. But like he, he would do at 18 months, he had a, he had an alphabet puzzle and the kid could do it. If the letters were any direction upside down, uh, you know, whatever he could do it in, in next to no time. He knew mm-hmm. his, he knew his alphabet without having to do the song. I mean, kid was really smart. <laughs> yeah. And he got a little older though. Um, you know, looking back, he was erratic and he was charged up and constantly talking and running around. And then I was, I was at work one day and, uh, my wife stayed home with, uh, with him. And she said, I was watching him watch TV and he had this tick that went from his lower back to his butt down his leg, which is one I have. And Mm -hmm. she said, that's when I'm like, Oh, so he's, he, this is, he's probably, he's probably got threats. And so from there on, we, he was three at that point. So from there on, you know, we kind of started, we started down that path of working with him. Okay. So, uh, how, how was your son kind of handled? I mean, for for one, starting off with enormous family support is, is huge, but you know, at school, social situations, things like that. You know, one of the one of the first things we did, I, it wasn't long after that tick. It might have been six months. We we went to a neurologist, and, and um, it was it was an experience that I am still really 
angry about. And the, the neurologist, I, he, my son, which is a child neurologist, had a similar experience to, to what I did. And the neurologist goes, well, yeah, he has threats, but there's nothing to do. So I don't know why you're even looking for this right now. Hmm. And it was just, it, it was one of those things where I, I couldn't imagine if a parent who had a child and they didn't have Tourette's, what the response would be, because it was just, I, I mean, I was kind of floored because I'm like, well, it's important to know this, this, this is, you know, this is a huge thing for my son and it's going mm-hmm. to be a huge thing for him. Uh, I, I don't care if there's anything that you can do. I want to know what that is. So we, we yeah. immediately stopped going to that neurologist and found a different one who was, she was, she was very responsive and she understood and kind nice. of started down a path of talking about what was going on. So um, we, we got a good neurologist, but I, I'll say when uh, my son started, started school in kindergarten, it was, it, it, he had a hard time adjusting yeah. and his Tourette's is a lot more pronounced than, than mine is. And he has a heavy dose of ADHD with it. Mm-hmm. So he had a lot of impulse control issues. He had a lot of issues kind of in the classroom. Um, and it was within the first few days that I had to go to school and I'm like, look, he, he has Tourette's and I, I, I acknowledge that he's a disruption. We're, we're going to have to do something with this because that's the deal. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it, it was an adjustment. It was an adjustment. And, uh, you know, most it, it, kindergarten was kind of rough. Um, but when we got a little further in and, you know, he got old enough that you could start talking about medication for ADHD and things that got a little easier, but there was a, I mean, to answer your question, there was a big adjustment when, when he first got into school, there was a big adjustment. How were uh, his teachers and in, in understanding? <laughs> Um, they were, they were, they were, they were pretty good. Uh, his, his kindergarten teacher, it was her first year and she, so she was kind of feeling, feeling out a lot of things and I felt kind of bad for it. Cause it, listen, here, I, I, I've tried to put myself in the position of, of some of these teachers, right? Having a kid in the room with Tourette's and, and who has all these different issues, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. And I'm, we're asking them to do things for, our son that has to happen, but I try to recognize it's different, right? I'm asking you to do more work for my son than you may be doing for another kid in the class. Um, but, but his first grade and second grade teacher were the same. No, I'm sorry. Second grade and third grade teacher were, were the same teacher. And it was her hmm. first full year teaching. And she was great. She was outstanding. She really took the time to work with him. She really took the time to get, you know, to recognize when he was having problems and things. And uh, that was kind of the, we started figuring out how to work with what was, what was going on and a better way to engage with the school. Cause you know, you gotta be an advocate for your kid, but mm-hmm. when your kid, you know, is, is the, is the active hyperactive one um, kind of hard, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's easy to say, Hey, you need to be doing this. And you know, your kid is kind of a distraction to some of the other kids. And, and yeah. I, I don't want that to be, I don't want that to be taken kind of the wrong way, but you know, no, I, I, got I you. try to acknowledge my kids, tough. Uh, my kids tough to, tough to work with in the classroom when, it's, when mm. he was small. Uh, do, do, do they ever reach out to you with questions or are, are, are you a resource for them and kind of helping them understand, or is it already built in pretty well? Yeah, I, it, it's, we normally get questions now as he got, as he got older, um, the conversation obviously got different because we got away from more of the distraction kind of stuff and more into how does he learn? How does, how do we get him through homework? Um, yeah. cause my kid's smart, right? And still is a smart kid. Um, but he has trouble, uh, um, he, he has trouble paying attention, has trouble getting through lots of homework. Yeah. Um, my wife has luckily really encouraged reading in the house. And so he's a pretty good reader, even though he gets easily distracted. He's a good reader, um, which I was not as a, as a kid. I, I didn't realize that until I was much older. But um, so a, a lot of as he got older, got more into, well, how did you do things talking to me? And mm-hmm. I would try to help them through the different things that I did, the different struggles I had. Um, but but it, it's always tough. 
you, you got to be an advocate for your kid. And, you know, you got to you got to go into this understanding the challenge you're putting on the teacher, but also understanding they have to help your kid. Um, and, 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 uh, you know, it, it's, your kid deserves to be, um, uh, paid attention to and, and deserves to have them help them do the things that they need to be successful. And, you know, uh, kind of heading into it, eyes open. Um, it, 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 it was a struggle, but, but it's been, it's been next year. So, yeah. So he's doing great though. He, he's doing well. Um, uh, so he, he's in high school now and yeah. as he's gotten it, um, my wife homeschooled him through middle school cause he was having a lot of trouble and kids are brutal in middle school and he had yeah. tons mm-hmm. of ticks and things like that. So yeah. he's gone back to public school and high school and that's been an adjustment, but as he's kind of matured, um, he's been able to handle things, handle things well. Now I, I'll say this. He's a different kind of student than I was. Uh, His level of um, ADHD kind of brings into some challenges as far as what he can tolerate homework wise and things like that. That's been an adjustment in, Hey, what, what level of success? Well, I say success, I mean, grade wise, not, you know, I I mean, not the overall success as a student, but you know, you have to kind of accept, some of these things, he's not going to be on, on point for everything. He's going to have some low grades because he's not able to pay attention. And that's, you know, even, even if you give him every exception possible, there's going to be challenges, but um, we have an IEP. And I think that's specific to North Carolina, which is an individual education plan. Mm-hmm. And parents work with the teachers on a way to manage a student's um education, their day, how they do homework, how they're allowed to test and things like that. So, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. Um, but it, you know, we, we've gotten positive response from the school. Um, but it's, it's still a lot of work. I, I mean, you, you have a special needs kid and Hey, you know, it, it, there's going to be work to, to have to do there. So if I'm allowed to ask, uh, how did you meet your wife and was, uh, and this is the most generic question, but I mean, what was Tourette's a dynamic or did she have sort of, did she pick up on things that she had to ask you questions about, or did you just kind of, how did it all come up? We met uh, through a friend, friend of a friend. And, mm. uh, I, I brought it up early. I, I mean, it was, we met when, when I had just turned 21. So it was kind of a, it was kind of a new thing, but I had already gone through the, Hey, I've got to give a heads up to people because I, mm-hmm. yeah. I say, I take some things. I don't want you to think I'm, I'm reacting to in shock over nothing <laughs> basically that you said. So, mm. you know, she, she's known, uh, the, she's known, I think for the entire time that, that we've, that we've been together since we met. So, um, it's never really, it's never really been an issue. I mean, she's adjusted to physical movements and things like that. And so she, she gets it and she's, I mean, she's adjusted and I, and I'll tell you if she wasn't before now with two of us, <laughs> two of us in the house, <laughs> she has, she has had to adjust completely. So, um, <laughs> it, but she, she's known since I, I, I think I told her the first time we went out. What did, I mean, how, how did that go uh, in terms of her reaction? So she was, uh, you know, I, I went through the whole, okay, I have Tourette's. No, it's not TV t- style Tourette's that you, that you see. Uh, and when I say TV style Tourette's, I, I mean, the, the, the full version of what they like to put on TV. And I don't, I don't mean to go with like put on TV, but you mm-hmm. know, there, yeah. there, there's no spectrum at all that's shown. Um, so I had to go through, you know, what this was, what it did, what it meant about me. And I didn't know everything then. Right. I, I mean, I only yeah. knew what I experienced and I knew what the neurologist had told me. Oh yeah, so, exactly. Um, I, I still don't know. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I mean, you know, I, with my, with my kid, I've learned a lot and I've learned so many more things about myself when I was young, weren't environmental, they were genetic. And mm-hmm. it, it, that's been, that's been interesting too. So, um, no, her, I mean she 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 got the she got the download from uh, from the get go. So you know, <laughs> she 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 kind of she went in she went all in uh, whether she is happy about it now or not. <laughs> um, well, uh, outside of your your family and subtracting me, uh, do, do you ever talk to other people who have Tourette syndrome? Or uh, I mean, it's it's rare for a lot of people. I I, I don't. And, and before. 
before you and I reacted, uh, I reacted, interacted, um, I hadn't really. And the, the podcast has been really amazing in giving perspective around kind of the spectrum of what's, of what's there. Um, I, I had, uh, I had no idea that a lot of people went through a lot of the same feelings and things like that. I mean, it's one thing to kind of, I guess, academically know that, that yeah. people are going through this, but to hear folks talk about it and to hear folks talk about a lot of times what, how they feel about a chick or um, I, I don't remember if it was you or someone else that was talking about a drawer opening um, that, that, that was sounding a certain oh, way. Oh yeah, that was Tim. I, yeah. I completely, I completely um, uh, feel that because there are certain times something needs to, 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 to sound a certain way or feel a certain way yeah. um, before it's done. So um <laughs> You know, it, it's that that was interesting just to just to hear some of the folks um, folks go through that. It, it, it's I had not interacted, but it was so funny hearing so many people have um, have similar experiences. So, yeah, it, it's it's I, I think it's really important what you said too about kind of separating out the ac, the, the the academic kind of clinical understanding of what Tourette syndrome is and versus really living with it and understanding the the spectrum and the the diversity that that comes with it because because the, the like you said I mean I, I'm I don't consider myself an expert on anything but my own experiences like yes I do have more of more than a, a layman's understanding uh, of what Tourette syndrome is uh, from the clinical side as well. But, but I'm still, and especially through this podcast, I mean, th there have been really, really like just for me, valuable conversations I've had with other people who have really, really affected my perception of myself and about Tourette syndrome overall and kind of how to regard it and what people go through. And I, there have definitely been times where I found myself in the crowd of people who have kind of a stereotypical view and uh, on certain things. And, and, and I think we, you and I have talked about this before too, about, you know, the, the sort of energy that some people in, inside the TS community put on saying, you know, but I don't have coprolalia or I don't yeah. swear, or it, th there's one thing to, it's important to educate people on what it is. Um, but there is a way to do it without saying, but I'm not like them. And because that's, that's, you know, uh, discriminatory and it's, uh, as much as we want understanding for what we go through, uh, so do people with coprolalia or any other part of the spectrum. And I mean, it's just, I've had to check myself and be like, wait, 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 wait. Like the, the way I just phrased that or, or the way I just marginalized somebody by separating myself from them, that was not cool. And I'm really conscious of that now. And it's because of these conversations through the podcast that have kind of led me there. And I feel like I'm kind of a, a better person and more empathetic on, on a lot of fronts because of that. And, and I'll say Ben, there, there was, uh, I, I retired something that I used to say a lot and it was, it, it was something that was disarming for, uh, people I was dealing with, uh, mm -hmm. cause it was kind of a joke, but I used to say I have Tourette's, but I don't bark or curse. This yeah. Yeah. Podcast changed that because yeah, I, I mean, th that's, I would not want to be the example someone else gives of how I'm not like them. I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's not, that's, that's, that's not okay. And, and I realized yeah. that. And so I, I, I stopped saying that, but um, I mean, you always got a positive response to that. You got to chuckle. Ha ha ha. But mm -hmm. it, it's not funny. I, that's not a funny thing. And I, I realized that after listening to a lot of these um, interviews that you've done, that, that that's, that's not okay. So I, I retired that and I, I feel a lot better about that afterwards. And, you know, when, when I hear somebody, when, when somebody asks that question, um, you know, I, I, I try to educate them a little bit without, you know, I, I don't want to jump down somebody's throat because they say something like that because mm -hmm. the media has made it very clear that that's what Tourette's is. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and, and it, it, that it's a funny thing and ha ha ha, you, you know, uh, so it, it's, I, I try to make sure they understand that, you know, there, there's a big spectrum. Um, and that, that's, that's, that's folks are struggling with that and that's not funny and it's not something to, to laugh about. Um, it's who that person is and, 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 you know, uh, just trying to get away from that, I guess, media persona of what, um, what Tourette's is and just make sure folks understand. Yeah, that that's, I mean, that's a really, really good point that, um, that you, it's, it's understandable 
Um, it's not okay, but it's understandable how people view Tourette syndrome the way they view it. Because I mean, you, uh, y- your, your brain is filled with what, you know, the environment around you presents. And if you've been told again and again, and again, and again, and again, I mean, th- there are fallacies out there left and right, but, but if that's all, you know, uh, about Tourette syndrome based on what the media, uh, or portrayals have fed you over the years. And, and this is over decades, you know? Yeah. Then, then that's that's how you're going to view it, and so and I think the way I've kind of gone, kind of gone about it after sort of wising up to um, not needing to separate myself from carpalalia or uh, or whatever the, the 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 joke might be, um, I just kind of when I brought up that I do have Tourette syndrome or someone notices something about me, and this is usually I'm just kind of thinking in the context of of coworkers and people like that, but. Um, but I, I kind of wait for them to present it to me that, oh, well, I never hear you swear or, or something like that. But usually when I tell somebody that I, I do have Tourette syndrome, I just kind of, that's what it is. And, and I'll, I'll describe some of my tics. And if that gets their curiosity going that, well, wait a minute, what about the swearing? What about the, then that's, you know, that's kind of when I kind of go down that road of educating them about the, the, the huge diversity of what TS is versus what the portrayal is. And, and that's something sure. that you could lay over, you know, so many things that are misunderstood, you know, different kinds of diabetes or, you know, just, just fill in the blank. And it, I, I found it's been kind of like a refreshing way to, to go about it and have a conversation. Cause I think that kind of organically builds up to, you know, an accurate portrayal of Tourette syndrome without me having to kind of jump into, but that thing, you know, about copper Lelia, that's, that's something else Or you know, it's just, I, I think it's a better expense of energy. No, I agree. I, I mean, it, it, this podcast has been good with that. Cause I mean, you know, I, I know a lot of folks listening to the podcast have, well, I'm assuming most have uh, either experience Tourette's themselves or someone in their family. And I think it's important to hear how do you approach these conversations that people need to hear? And it is important, right? I, I mean, mm-hmm. Tourette's is a lot more common, I think, than, than, than folks know. And uh, it, it, how do you discuss these things when there's only been one view of Tourette's presented? So, Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for anybody listening, too, and I, I think we have been clear, um, but for anybody listening who maybe hasn't heard this talked about in past episodes is that, you know, in, in my mind, there's, there's no stigma on any kind of Tourette syndrome at all. Like n- nothing to, you know, if, if copper Lelia is your tick, that's, th- that's, that that's what you have. And, and that's perfectly yeah. ac- acceptable to me. That's not, not anything that needs to be controlled. I, I'm not the kind of person that says, you know, like that's where we need to medicate people because that's socially unacceptable or yeah. they're never going to get ahead in life because they have something that's going to, that's going to be viewed negatively that I, I don't view it that way at all. I, you know, is what you have is what you have and you're the person you are and you can control what you can and what you can't control. Well, I mean, if yeah. your tics are causing you pain or if they really, really are a barrier and you really do, I mean, how you want to go about it is your decision, just as long as it's your decision and you're not medicating yourself because you think everybody else expects you to. And that's right. that's been really important for me and something I've had to learn more just by talking with other people. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, 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 I 100% agree with that. And I, I, I think, you know, you have to be your own advocate um, mm-hmm. in, in, in situations. So, no, I agree. Wow, we've been going for 53 minutes now, according to my my timer. It doesn't feel like that. I mean, this has been really fun. I mean, we've been really kind of breezing through a lot of this stuff. Uh, I want to make sure that there's nothing I, I failed to to ask or or anything that's kind of on your mind that we wouldn't otherwise get to. Um, uh, wh- where are we at? Yeah, I, I will mention one thing. So, yeah. you know, it talks a lot about the struggles around having having a kid with Tourette. There are some funny moments of having two people with Tourette's in the house. I say mm-hmm. this is funny. My wife may not think it's that funny, but <laughs> we'll feed ticks off of each other. And it, it's, I don't have many vocal ticks. He doesn't have many vocal ticks. But there are times when the few that we have will bounce back and forth. And there was one time when he was young and my youngest son had just been born and he was, <laughs> he would lay down for a nap. And there was this car commercial that was on. <laughs> that I don't remember what the saying was, but it would uh-huh. come on the TV and either I would say it 
before I was able to stop, or he would say it, and it would get so loud because it was the car commercial, me and him, or the car commercial, him and me. And my wife would just be like, could you guys shut up? The baby's asleep. And it would be, so, I mean, we, we have little things like that. And he and yeah. I would joke about things a long time into, it's not funny anymore, but for yeah. us, it's one big circle of everything. So, um, you know, it, it's one of those things that having two folks with threats in the house can be funny and it, it you know, it can be tough too. I mean, we, you know, we have our moments, but, um, it, you, you can, if you recognize the things that are unique to having Tourette's with two people in there, it can be funny. Now, my wife, like I said, may not think it's always so funny, <laughs> but I think it's kind of funny between, between me and I. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, I, I definitely have to say something about that too, because I, <clears throat> I, I definitely feel, uh, I, I, I feel for my, my wife sometimes because I, I definitely have, and compulsion is the wrong word, I think, but, uh, in the context we're talking about, but I, I definitely, if something, the dumbest joke, stupidest punchline, <laughs> worst observation, I, I mean, I just, I, I can't bottle it up and keep it, keep it inside. And I don't know if that's related to just me or if that's Tourette syndrome or, or what, I mean, it, it, it may, may be completely unrelated, but it is something that just the most groaning thing you could think of. I'm going to say it out loud and, and I'm not talking about offensive stuff. I just mean just the dumbest, stupidest pun or, you know, just, and, and, and I'll, I'll do it. And I think it's already, I think it's gotten to the point where it's so obvious and she knows I'm going to do it and it's hanging in the air and it's sort of, okay, how many seconds is, are, are going to pass before he, and so there have been so many times <laughs> where we've been in a situation where the joke is obvious the the worst joke is hanging out there in the air. When is he going to say it out loud? And she'll, she'll say, go ahead and say it. <laughs> and, and then I'll, I'll let it out. And then it's just, and, and it's almost like just driving into the ground. Like you said, it's, it's, it's kind of like creating that circle. Uh, where something is just, it starts off maybe a little bit funny and then you go further and further and further with it. It gets dumber and drier and it loses all of its energy. But then at some point it becomes so absurd that you're still making the same joke that it kind of like wakes itself back up and there, it has this like new absurd energy that makes it funny again. And I think that's what I'm always kind of going for. Like I, I want to push it to that level and then I'm satisfied. <laughs> Man, it, 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 it's funny to us, and that's and I guess that that's the that's the good thing. Everybody else, at least they'll if they'll put up with it, we get a laugh out of it. So no, I I, I have that I have that same thing. I, I um just I have an affinity for dumb humor in some in some cases, and some of oh, the yeah. dumbest stuff will get stuck. And and <laughs> I you know I can I can listen to it or watch it over and over and over again. And to me, it's funny like I've never seen it before. And it might be funny because I've seen it so many times. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I I completely recognize that it may not be funny at all to anyone else. So um, <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. Well, man, I, th this this has been this has been really really great. I mean, I I feel like this has been kind of a a highlight and definitely a long time coming. Uh, the, 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 the further I go with this <clears throat> and the more people I hear from, the, the more that question comes up about wh whether it's school or managing something in the family or creating some sense of under understanding outside. And uh, th th there have been a, a lot of good takeaways just about seeing it as, as something to accept and see it for its advantages and, and not as something that's necessarily exclusively a problem that we need to, to solve. No, I, I mean, it's, it not hiding right i yeah. mean there, because there's, there's no there's no reason and, and most people have a positive response to it and just not hiding behind you know uh, being being worried about what somebody's going to say or whatever i mean it's it, it's who you are uh you're going to have a few people who are going to be ridiculous about it but for the most part uh, you know people get it and, and they 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 have questions and it's okay to answer the questions and no, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm big advocate for people knowing what's going on. Man. Well, Reggie, man, th thank you so much, really. I mean, and again, I, I, I want to make sure. sure I don't, um, short you on, on anything else that's, that's on your mind. No, th this is, this is, this is good. I've enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, it's good. Hey, listen, I, yeah. your podcast is outstanding. Man. I, I mean, like, seriously, it, it's helped, it, it's helped so much. And I, I hope, you know, I, I can't. I don't remember if it was an interview you did or an email, but it was from a younger girl who her parents were having trouble um, accepting it was to Yeah, yeah. I think it was. 
And, and that was um, uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, right? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you know, it, it, it's that's 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 tough to hear having kid kind of her age and having having them through it. You you need support, and, and if you're wrong that, that it's it, it's not Tourette syndrome and it's something else, well. Figure out what it is, yeah. right? I, I mean, it, it, it's not a. It, it doesn't. It doesn't hurt to head down that path. And, and um, I don't know. That was kind of heartbreaking. So I, I, I really hope. I, I really hope folks get more more open about it because it's it, it's just. I don't know, man. There's there's life's too short to to hide behind yeah. to, to to hide behind what you think is a bad thing. So. Thanks for listening. Thanks endlessly to Reggie for taking the time. It, it meant a lot to me, and I'd love to know what you guys think. You know, did anything in particular resonate? I know in some cases we, or I anyway, repeated some things I've already said in past episodes, but I mean, this is a progression, and these conversations are real, and they go where they go. And, you know, from here, it's it's a conversation that involves you with either me or your friends or strangers or other people with TS, whoever. Just talk with somebody and make sense of things together. And I I like how Reggie, in the course of our conversation, touched on some of the elements that Justin brought up with this question at the start of the episode about kind of, you know, hiding or getting away from the label of TS and the merits of that. Weigh in on that, by the way. Let me know what you think. Tourette's Podcast at gmail.com or the Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook. So check this out. This was episode 13. And if you looked at the number of episodes from season one, then you might assume that we're winding down season two. And that's true, but not so suddenly. I've got a couple more episodes ahead and they're great. Uh, One of them is actually unlike any other conversation I've had on this show. So some really cool stuff to come. Keep in touch in the meantime, and we'll be back next week with episode 14. I'll talk to you soon. This is Ben. Ben.